Have you ever been scuba diving? Talk to a scuba diver and they'll probably tell you that it's the greatest thing ever. But scuba diving isn't easy. It takes hard work, training, and a lot of hours in the water. You need to develop experience. If you decide to do it, here's one piece of advice. Go early in the day. Why you ask? When scuba divers swim along the bottom, they kick up sand and other sediment into the water. We refer to this phenomenon as turbidity. Turbidity is the presence of particles suspended in water. The particles may be microscopic organisms, pollution, or sediment like sand. Any particles that are small and light enough that they do not immediately sink to the ocean floor cause turbidity. These particles act like smoke in the water, adding to its cloudiness. Under the right conditions, particles kicked up by a scuba diver may ultimately settle to the surface and be redeposited on the seafloor. However, this takes time. Fine grain sediment in the water can stay suspended there for hours or more. And until then, the particles in the water will block light, limit your vision, and obscure the scenery around you. The best way to avoid turbidity and have the best experience at a popular dive site is to get up early and beat the crowds. If turbidity teaches us one thing, it's that sediment moves over time. Sedimentology is the science of sediment. It covers everything from the formation and erosion of sediment to its deposition and lithification. Sediment forms from a variety of sources. Lithogenous sediment forms from the breakdown of igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic rock. Biogenous sediment forms from the hard, mineralized shells of organisms. Hydrogenous sediment forms from chemical precipitation reactions in water. And cosmogenous sediment forms from material brought to Earth from outer space. Regardless of how the sediment forms, it is almost always transported from its place of origin by agents of erosion, gravity, wind, running water, and ice. Sediment has a tendency to move downhill with gravity. It will blow in the wind. And when there is turbidity, sediment particles suspended in water will move in the direction of the current or downhill in the direction of gravity. Glaciers grow, move, and shrink over time. The growth of glaciers and ice sheets, which till the earth as they advance over the landscape, can also move sediment. Ultimately, at the end of its journey, the sediment will be deposited and spread out. The deposition of sediment is more correctly called sedimentation. It is the settling of particles out of a fluid, like air or water, so that they are no longer in motion. The sediment spreads out into layers called strata. These strata ultimately undergo lithification, becoming compacted and cemented into sedimentary rock. Let's focus now on the history of sediment between its origin and its deposition. Let's talk about the movement and transport of sediment. When we talk about sediment transport, we need to distinguish between the movement of the sediment and the movement of the fluid around it. In general, the fluid that moves sediment will almost always be either moving water or blowing air. Both of these moving fluids 
have essentially the same behavior or fluid dynamics. Fluids tend to move in one of two ways. A fluid either moves as a laminar flow where all molecules within the fluid move parallel to each other in the direction of transport, or the fluid moves as a turbulent flow, wherein the molecules all move in different trajectories in the direction of flow. A fluid may begin as a laminar flow, but if you increase the flow velocity, it will become turbulent over time. The viscosity or thickness of the fluid also affects the flow. Generally speaking, moving ice and flowing lava tend to have laminar flow because they are very viscous fluids. Moving air, which has a very low viscosity, is a turbulent flow at virtually all velocities. Moving water, not surprisingly, is somewhere in between. It is a laminar flow at low velocity and a turbulent flow at high velocity. Given that sediment tends to move in air and high velocity moving water, most flows that carry significant amounts of sediment are turbulent in nature. This realization helps to explain how sediment moves. Sediment grains can move by traction, sliding and rolling along the bottom of a flow without losing contact with the bed surface beneath it. They can also move through saltation. Saltation is essentially movement through jumping. Particles are periodically picked up by turbulence in the flow, leave the bed, and get transported a short distance before returning to the surface. Lastly, sediment can move in suspension. In suspension, turbulence within the flow produces sufficient upward motion to keep the particles up in the moving fluid and carry them along until there's no longer enough turbulence to keep them moving. A line is usually drawn between the sediment particles in suspension and those moving through saltation and traction. The traction and saltation grains are collectively known as the bed load. They are the sediment that move along the bed. The suspension, in turn, is called the suspended load. The sizes of the bed and suspension loads in a flow depend on its velocity and the sizes of the grains in the sediment. In other words, they depend on the energy of the flow and how fast it's moving. Think about it. Wind is energy. So is flowing water and gravity. And when you apply this energy to sediment, it moves. The amount of energy it takes to move sediment depends on the size of the grains. Although a turbulent flow may have sufficient energy to lift clay and silt sized grains into suspension, it may only be strong enough to move sand and gravel sized grains through traction and saltation. Generally, larger grains move through traction, smaller grains move through suspension. That said, if the velocity and energy of a flow is increased, grains in the bed load will begin to move through suspension as part of the suspended load. Likewise, if the velocity and energy of a flow suddenly drops to zero, then there will be sedimentation of the grains in the suspended and bed loads. For sedimentation to occur, Sediment must be moved to an environment or place where there is no longer enough energy to keep it in motion.
This chart is called a Joulstrom diagram. The settling velocity curve or lower curve illustrates the relationship between flow velocity on the vertical axis and the sizes of particles that are already in motion on the horizontal axis. Let's say we have a particle of fine sand in motion. If we decrease the flow velocity to less than one centimeter per second, then there will no longer be enough energy to keep the grain in motion. The class will be deposited. The upper curve in the Joulstrom diagram, the erosion velocity curve, illustrates the flow velocity required to move a particle that is at rest, a particle that is not moving. Let's assume this time that we have a particle of fine sand at rest. In order to move this grain, we would need to increase the flow velocity to 30 or 40 centimeters per second in order to move the particle. Let's do one more example. This time, let's assume we have two grains which are in motion, one fine sand particle and a piece of gravel. What would happen if we decrease the flow velocity to 10 centimeters per second? Would the grains remain in motion or would they be deposited? Pause the video now and try to figure it out yourself. All right. Do you have an answer? The answer is that the sand grain would remain in motion, but the gravel clast would be deposited. This makes sense. Intuitively, it takes more energy to move a piece of gravel than it does a piece of sand. Before we move on, you may be wondering why the left side of the Joulstrom diagram looks funny. Why does it take a very high velocity flow to erode and move clay-sized particles at rest? The answer is not intuitive. The reason is because clay-sized particles consist of clay minerals, and clay minerals are very cohesive making it very difficult for a flow to separate them and train them and put them in motion. Clay minerals stick together when they are deposited, so it takes a higher velocity flow to move them again than you would expect. There is another interesting consequence of this cohesion, flocculation. Flocculation is the clumping of clay particles into groups or clumps called flocks. Flocks have faster sedimentation rates than individual clay particles. They are deposited much faster than other clays. Flocks mainly form in the presence of positively charged cations, like sodium and calcium, which you find in salt water. So, because of this, most clays and most flocks are deposited in marine and brackish environments, where you find saline conditions, ocean environments, lagoons, deltas, and tidal flats. They are all sites of clay deposition. Clearly, the factors that affect the movement and deposition of sediment have a big effect on lithology. In what ways do you think transport affects the texture and fabric of a clastic rock? You've already learned that it takes more energy to move a larger, heavier grain than a smaller, lighter one. Natural processes are far more likely to move small particles like clay, silt, and sand than larger pebbles 
cobbles and boulders. Therefore, everything else being equal, small grains are prone to traveling farther than larger ones. We can see this phenomenon in the ocean. Sediment in the ocean comes from land. On the coast, you find beaches of sand, but if you venture further out to sea, you find that the seafloor consists of silt, and in the deepest, quietest, lowest energy water, the sediment consists of clay. This clay travels further out to sea than silt or sand because it's smaller. It doesn't require as much energy for movement. A related observation deals with the rounding and sorting of grains. Recall that sediment may be well sorted and consist of particles that are all the same size, or it may be poorly sorted and the grains may have many different sizes. The particles may also be very angular in shape or they may be round and spheroidal. Sediment grains become rounder and better sorted as they are transported. An immature sediment located near its place of origin will be poorly sorted and consist of angular grains. As the sediment is transported, it will become more mature. Its grains will be become better sorted and more rounded and spheroidal. Since silt and clay sized particles tend to travel farther, they tend to always be well sorted sediments with round grains. In any case, you now have enough understanding to begin looking at modern depositional environments and to start thinking about how their fluid dynamics may ultimately be affecting the sediment and sedimentary rocks that form there. It is an important skill that we will work on developing together.